Welcome back. Today we're going to be talking about the difference between um, an F2 astrograph versus an APO refractor um, with focal reducers for deep sky imaging. Uh, there's a lot of other, um, there's other designs out there, but these are the most popular and we want to focus on these because these are the ones we have in the, in the um, observatory. So there's basically, uh, there's two. There's um, essentially, there's reflectors and refractors. So <clears throat> on the left-hand side, we're going to be talking about the fast F2 reflector astrographs. Um, there's two out there, the two popular ones that are out there. There's others, but these are the very popular ones. Uh, the first is the um, Hyperstar. And interestingly enough, it was introduced by Celestron. They had it for a year or two and then abandoned it. And then uh, Starazona took it over. Don't know the history of that, but if you want a Hyperstar, you buy it from Starazona, Starazona in Tucson, Arizona. Um, they're very fast. Uh, the characteristic of it is you take out the secondary mir mirror on a schmidt cassegrain optical tube assembly and you insert in the front, you can see in the picture below, you sit in the front and that's the lens and the camera sensor sits on top of that. So very fast, uh, a C14 for example is an F1.9. Now Celestron uh, recently has introduced a new design and it, you know, it's, it's similar in um, you know, utility I suppose. Um, and I, 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 it looks like a, uh, an improvement of the Hyperstar design. I don't know the history of it, but it works essentially similar. Uh, you have a, uh, in the place of the Hyperstar, what you have is a, uh, you have a built-in four lens element group and there's an optical window and the camera sens sensor again screws onto the front of the telescope and um, that's how you image it's an f2.2 so essentially they're about the same on the right hand side we have um, apo refractors with focal reducers because if you're going to use astro imaging what you want to be you, what you need a is a field flattener and a focal reducer the focal reducer increases your f-stop and the field flattener ensures that you have a very flat um, edge to edge image on your uh, camera sensor so the, in the observatory, we've got two. Um, there's a lot of different manufacturers. You know, this is Explore Scientific, there's Skywatcher, there's a, tons of others. Um, there's a 102 millimeter and an 80 millimeter um, with a focal reducer. It's a 0.8, which turns the uh, scopes into, goes from an F7 for the 102 to an F5.6. And the, um, the 80 millimeter APO, aprochromatic, which I should mention means the red, green, and blue rays are all focused uh, on, on the, you know, together on the same film, film plane. So there's no strange distortions or apochromatic uh, distortions like purple fringing around stars and things like that. Uh, it goes from an F6 to an F4.8 F using a field flattener. So uh, what we'll do is let's just hop over into the observatory and we'll take a look at the scopes. Uh, All right, our first look here, the different uh, two different types of telescopes is the um, is the fast F2 reflector astrograph. Uh, what you're looking at is a hyperstar configuration. It's a C14, a Celestron 14-inch optical tube assembly. And if you look at the front of the telescope, you'll see there's actually three components up there. A few quick comments here about the imaging system. Um, this is actually a 750 millimeter f1.9 lens. The uh, bottom part here is called a hyperstar, and that's the optical system that converts the telescope into a f1.9 light bucket, really. And on top is our imaging camera. It's a monochrome astronomy camera. Super cooled, it's got two fans and uh, heat dissipation um, elements, and you can do very, very long exposures. Its function is speed, and it's extremely sensitive, and when used in conjunction with narrowband filters, it's a really an excellent uh, scope for deep, uh, deep sky imaging. 
Um, you can penetrate light pollution using narrowband filters, you know, in the, anywhere in the neighborhood of like a 7 nanometer to an 8 nanometer hydrogen, oxygen, or sulfur, and it just creates stunning images um, in light polluted areas. So that's what its big advantage. To talk about uh, the refractors, I'm going to start off with um, this one. This is this is basically one of my favorite scopes. Um, this is a um, this Explore Scientific. It's a 102, about a 714 millimeter focal length. Um, I do have a focal reducer on here. It's a Teleview. It's 0.8, so that brings the scope to like a 5.6, which is which is okay for um, most uh, deep sky objects, but the really faint ones, you know, it's better to go with the um, the astrographs. But anyway, let me just kind of show you what, what's in the optical path here. This is just like a, a regular lens, right? So you've got, this is a triplet, so there's three aprochromatic lenses up front. And aprochromatic means that red, green, and blue all focus exactly on the, on the film plane, and that's what you want. Um, so as we kind of go back backwards here, um, we got some extenders here um, just so we can get to focus. This right here is the focal reducer. It's a Teleview, like I said, 0.8. And the other cool thing here is um, right here in the back, this is uh, a carousel for the filters. So as with the astrographs, you have to you know you have to slide in each individual filter when you need to change them. Um, with the, you know, with the filter wheel, you know, it's USB controlled, and all I have to do is just, you know, once I'm done imaging with uh, HA, I just, you know, tell the software, go to, you know, sulfur, and it just does it automatically. So that means that the really cool thing about this whole thing is that it can be automated. So if you use something like uh, a Sequence Generator Pro software, you can program your entire night. Um, you know, because you've got your filters, you've got your filters here that you can change, um, and you can set everything up so that you can just, you know, just go to sleep. <laughs> uh, can't do that with an astrograph. Um, so anyway, um, what's the other really cool thing? And here's the here's the cameras attached to the back. So um, I love this. Um, I think with the refractors, what I find is that you get uh, sharper stars, um, more contrast, a little bit more detail. Now, with an astrograph, you can handle that in post, but I really like this setup. The only drawback is in highly light polluted skies sometimes. Some of the deep, you know, the deep sky, very faint objects are kind of hard to image. Um, not impossible, but you need, you know, 8, 12 hours of exposure, total exposure uh, data capture time for just a single channel. That's why you definitely want to use monochrome, a monochrome camera on this setup. Now this is the 102, um, there's bigger ones, and by the way, there's a lot of other manufacturers um, that make some really great scopes, Orion, um, Skywatcher, um, there's a lot. This is just to show you um, an 80, this is an 80 millimeter, this is great for deep sky if you're just starting out in astrophotography, um, a triplet, a, um, you know, APO, apochromatic, is a really great way to start. Um, it's very wide field, but that's okay because um, it's just a lot more forgiving, very sharp. You, and a lot of these nebulas and all of these deep space objects are huge. Um, you know, like, uh, like the Andromeda Galaxy, um, the California Nebula, North America Nebula. To actually capture the whole um, object, it's better to go wide, like with an 80. Uh, it's a good way to start out, nice, really nice scope. I like this too. Um, and another thing you can do, and it's still, it is a refractor. This is a this is a an 85 millimeter Samyang um, f 1.4. It's a Nikon mount, and in between here is I've got an adapter um, that uh, will uh, adapts it to a T mount, and in the back here I've got a, a Zwo camera. If you can see it right here, um, you can use your tele, your um, a lot of your telephoto lenses that you have in your photography kits already can be used. Uh, no problem. Um, you just have to adapt it so you can thread on your um, your, your T-thread uh, astro camera. Uh, the only drawback I, with this is that you can't use a remote focuser. It's really important to use a remote focuser, at least I, I think so. Um, in fact, with an astrograph, you have to have a remote focuser. 
you just can't dial that thing and then every time you touch the telescope thing moves all over the place. The only problem with here is that I have to actually take the camera off and put um, you know put my uh, filters, I have to screw the filter in. So I would say it's best to use this kind of a setup with an astronomy camera but maybe a one shot color and use it like a tri-band um, uh, dual band sort of narrow band filter to cut through the light pollution and get some nice rich colors. So you can use that too. Okay, uh, apologies about that background noise there in the observatory. There was actually a rainstorm going on while we did the recording. So <clears throat> that's what you heard in the background. So anyway, so here's the, again, the big advantage of an astrograph is speed. And just to kind of, this is an illustrative example, it's kind of an extreme, it's an ex extreme example, but uh, the Cave Nebula, um, I imaged this past fall, and here's the data, and this kind of gives you an idea of how fast this thing is. Um, it took 8.5 hours over three nights to capture all of the data in different monochrome channels. I used uh, a sulfur, hydrogen, and oxygen narrowband filters. Um, so at F2, if I use the 102 that you saw, that's a 5.6. And so that's really an 8x difference between F2 and F5.6. So if you do the math, you're looking at, you know, if you went, if you use the entire, um, you know, the, the, if you convert the 2.5, 3, 3 hours, and you get 24, 20, and 24 hours, which is not practical. I think I might have captured too much data on the hyperstar side you know, there's a lot of diminished returns of how much you can actually capture in terms of data, in terms of light. So I'm not sure, but at a minimum, I think I would need somewhere in the neighborhood of probably 12 hours for sulfur, eight for hydrogen, and 12 for oxygen. And the reality is I just don't have time to do that. A lot of us don't. Um, you know, we have to get up the next morning and go to work. Um, maybe you have to sit through a 720 slide PowerPoint presentation and you have to stay awake. So. Um, the only thing you can do there is if you automate, um, like using something like a Sequence Generator Pro and you put it on an equatorial mount and you can run your, you can run your whole sequence um, all night while you sleep, you know, that's okay. I can't do that. Can't do that with an astrograph and plus the, the mount in the uh, observatory is not uh, automated. So anyway, um, the pros and cons. It's one is really, really fast, and it's you know it's great for deep sky objects. The cons, uh, you can't use it for visual. The astrographs are just for just, just for imaging only. Um, they can be a real pain to, to calibrate. I mean, the the culmination. I mean, there's two there's two factors. There's there's Making and ensuring that the optical path, all the objects in the optical path are centered, that's number one. But the more difficult one is making sure everything is collimated, which really means everything has to be in parallel. So the image sensor's got to be in parallel with the, with the lens, which is with the corrector plate, with the mirror. And I can tell you from experience, getting that right can be really um, difficult. Um, you can't use a filter wheel. You got to use a slider. You slide your filters in and out. Um, not a big deal, but can't, that can't be automated. So a thing called mirror flop on these scopes. The it, sometimes the mirrors tend to move a little bit as the telescope moves throughout the, the night as you're imaging. Um, it'll you'll it'll look like a, a little smear of the stars. The stars won't be round. Sometimes you mistake that for guiding a problem, but it's not. The mirror just moved. And typically it's one or only two frames. It's just a pain why you try to keep your exposures down to less than five minutes. Um, on the hyperstar, there's a tendency for the star, the very bright stars, to kind of be bloated. You can handle that in post. I, all I have to say is you have to, you have to pretend that you're meditating. You need extreme patience and determination to make it work. But when it works, it works great. Um, APO refractors with focal reducers, right? So these are focal reducer to get a higher speed f-stop. I find get higher contrast and smaller stars. Um, I, I, like you see, you can automate it. Um, automation with an equatorial mount and using something like a, a Sequence Generator Pro software, like I mentioned, you can just program everything you want the scope to do all night, go to sleep, wake up the next morning and see what you've got. Uh, minimal calibration. 
Uh, you also can use these visually. The scopes can be used visually or you know, as an imaging um, uh, telescope. Uh, one really interesting development in the market that's, uh, that's come out, uh, Starazona has announced a 0.65x reducer flattener. Now that's kind of exciting because some of these scopes, like a 100 millimeter Star Watcher, Sky Watcher, is an F5. And using that reducer brings it to like an F3.2. Now we're getting really fast and we're approaching what an F2 Astro Wrap can do. And I would love to try that out. Um, that gets pretty interesting because it's kind of like the best of both worlds. Um, cons, lower max aperture. We talked about that, less light collection capability, so it takes you longer to image. Um, and one of the, I mean, the, and if you're doing deep sky, you're doing narrow band, uh, oxygen and sulfur filters can be difficult to capture. Um, so that's, so what would I use? Uh, based on my situation, I have a highly light polluted sky. I have to stick with the astrograph, the F2, um, with all its foibles. Um, I would, if I was traveling, if I was traveling to a dark site, like in the mountains or, um, you know, in the desert, you can get away with um, an APL refractor, especially with a 0.65 reducer. That would be like beautiful. Um, as you can tell, the size of the scopes, um, you can get eight. Um, on the astrograph side, you can get an eight inch, 11 and, six, and 14. Um, as you can see from the video, you can have a really small refractor. You can travel with that. And you can do, you know, dark, go to a dark site and do some really nice imaging. So, um, so there you, um, that's it. Um, what I want to do is just end with uh, uh, some images taken uh, this past fall with the Hyperstar. And if you uh, liked this video, if you found it interesting, please like, share, and uh, follow us. And uh, we'll see.